I'd like to talk about how you can use life, life cycle processes in, for education technology. A life cycle is what you do to look at what needs to be done to make a course better. Um, you do life cycle approaches all the time. Um, from making toast to turning on the car, you have a process that's so automatic you don't realize you do it. But you start out analyzing the situation, you decide what changes need to be made, you make them as you need to do them. In the program and development design course, you'll be taught about the ADDI uh, model of life cycle, which is analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. Uh, that's a five-phase model. I've seen models with as few as three phases or as many as 12. One 12 model is unnecessarily complex. <coughs> but uh, I chose a four-phase model. Now, it doesn't need to just apply to technology. It can apply to everything. Analysis, what do you need to teach? Planning, how am I going about teaching it? You teach it, implementation, and then you do your review. How did well did things go? And you take a look at how well things go, and you ask yourself, how could I do it better? Planning, teaching, reviewing and so on around the circle goes. The analysis phase, you ask yourself questions like, what isn't working? What could be done better? What are the priorities? And this is important because as time goes on, priorities can change, but lesson plans, course outlines can get rigid. And so every once in a while, you need to ask yourself, what is the priority? What, what should the students be learning? Are, you know, are we really looking at the right thing? What's the cost? Is there a cheaper, better way to do it? And the cost includes time, money, and resources. Uh, is there a bottleneck in a lab? Uh, would making certain changes actually cost more time than you can afford? So what's the cost? This is what you're looking at in the analysis phase. Last but not least, what is the probability of success? You know, not all changes are equal. Something that is cheap but has a high probability of success looks better than something that's expensive with a low probability of success. And then I would add check with the students. If you're making a significant change, talk to the students about it. Talk to your former students, your present students. Get their input into what's going on. Planning. You're concerned about where and how, or when and how, excuse me. You will need time to prepare. It's amazing how many administrators forget that time to prepare, time to implement and time to recover if there are problems. Uh, classic case in point, when I was hired by STI, I started work on, I believe, 
a Monday, just getting familiar with the course I was going to be teaching. But they were going to be teaching it online. They had what was a learning management system. No, that's too grandiose of a term. I think we called it that back then. It was a glorified test giving system. What was supposed to happen? I was supposed to videotape lectures. The students would watch the lectures, then they would go online and take these tests, which I had to prepare. Well, the software, which was run on a mainframe at the time, wasn't available until Thursday to be installed. Friday, I was trained in it. Monday, I had students. So I got some mats from down in the gym, and I slept in my office and uh, lived out of vending machines Saturday and Sunday while I got the questions coded. There had been no time to prepare, no time to implement, and if things hadn't have worked, there would be no time to recovery. Uh, as it turns out, it was a lousy idea to start with, but that's beside the point. Then your next question is how much to change. And if a part of a lesson, or is it a whole course, or all the courses in a program? Because that impacts how much time you need to prepare and time to implement. Small changes in core in lessons are easy to implement, don't take long to prepare, and if things go haywire, there's time to recover. If you're making major changes in programs or starting a program from scratch, totally different ballgame. And the next question is, how are you going to make these changes? Are you going to phase it in a little bit at a time? Are you going to change all of a lesson or just part of a lesson one time and then part of a lesson the next and so on? Or change a course in a program one semester, course in a program the next semester, and just keep changing courses one at a time? until they're all in. That's phased. That's gradual. If you run into a problem, it's easier to back up. Or you can get everything developed, and then you can run a pilot. So you've got most of the students going the old way, but you have a small group going the new way to see if it's going to work. That works, you know, here at SIAS, a Palliser campus, a pro department can try the new way. The other campuses would be doing it the old way. If once all the problems are worked out of Palter, then they implement it every place else. The last one, all at once, um, heard it referred to variously as the kamikaze approach, uh, the Russian roulette approach. Uh, basically, you're throwing the dice and hoping you win. Uh, it's not advised to do it that way. In some cases where you're maybe starting a whole new program, you don't have a whole lot of choice because there's no old way to fall back on. But all at once is nice to avoid if you can. And last but not least, you know, ask the students. What do they think would be good? What would be best for them? Implementation, basically, you take your changes and walk into the classroom. First step, prepare the students. Say, hey, we're doing something new. Every time I make a change to a course, I let the students know what I'm doing new this September. Or if, I, if I'm teaching a face-to-face -face class and I'm going to try something new in the class for the first time, I tell them I'm going to do something new. That prepares them to give you good, honest feedback of what's working and what isn't. And so if it blows up in your face, it's 
less egg on your face. They realize you're trying something new. And generally speaking, they appreciate effort. Get your setup and testing done early. A week before, I like to do a run-through. The day before, I go into the classroom and run through it again to make sure all the bells and whistles are there. And then I get there 15 minutes early, if at all possible, and get everything started to make sure the last instructor out the door didn't pull the plug on something important. And then you just do it and hope it works right. So then there's the review phase. There's an objective review where you're looking at student performance, marks, participation, what have you. Uh, when I switch to what would be called the flipped classroom approach, I did it before anybody had coined the term. Um, you know, I, the student work was better, of higher quality, the discussions were better, so on and so forth. It's a nice subjective review. There can be a peer review. You bring the other instructors in and say, hey, do you think this has worked right? There's a subjective review. And does the atmosphere of the course change with the changes? Sometimes just to be, you know, doing something new changes the atmosphere of the course for the better. Now, I'm not a big fan of the bandwagon effect. Doing something just to be doing, just to appear modern. But really, in all honesty, sometimes uh, changing the format to fit something that is more comfortable or advanced uh, for the students uh, helps. And there's personal. Is this something I can do constantly? Is is this something I want to do? I've tried, you know, for me, Twitter is the monster in the closet. I am just not a Twitter person. And I've had students say, well, we should Twitter in the course. And I've tried, and I'm just not a tweet. <laughs> and, of course, uh, you need to get the student's review. And when you're all done, you go back to analysis. So in summation, what, you, what needs to change? How is the best way to change? Make that change. And how did the change go? It's important to remember it's about the students. It's about learning outcomes. It's not about technology or change. And it's most certainly not about you. If something doesn't work, doesn't mean you're a bad person or you can't teach. It means the system just didn't work. Keep in mind that the best laid lesson with one class works beautifully. Next class falls flat on its face. And after 40 years in this racket, don't ask me why. Uh, I've never been able to figure out why one approach works with one class and doesn't with another. It's 180 out. It just happens. <laughs>